see that so many are interested in, in creating secure software. Um, just to let you know, I noticed there's a, there was a bug, so the printed software is showing the wrong talk. Uh, the printed schedule, um, sorry, the printed schedule shows the talk I gave last year. So this year I'm going to talk about creating secure software benefits from the cloud. So let's start off by who am I? My name is Daniel Sawano. I work at a company called Avanza Bank, which is an internet-based bank and stockbroker based in Stockholm in Sweden. And I spend most of my days, you know, writing code, thinking about architectural problems, and I also think a lot about uh, security challenges that we, we face as developers. And um, so what the topic is all about, security benefits from cloud thinking, what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at how we can utilize knowledge and ideas that we we as an industry have learned from building applications in the cloud and how we can use that knowledge to maybe make our applications and make our software more secure. So if you're unfamiliar with building applications in the cloud then just as a, as a point to, to a reference you can look at things like the 12-factor app methodology you don't have to be able to read everything that's on the slide, but this is pretty much where the ideas in this talk comes from. They come from the 12-factor app thinking, they come from cloud native, which is another term that tries to describe the properties of an application that is built to behave well in the cloud environment. And what we're going to look at today is you know, how we can we use these concepts and get better software regardless of whether we're running in the cloud or if we're running on-premise in the cloud-like environment. So we're going to look at how can we handle application configuration in a way that can make our systems more secure. How can we treat application processes in a way that will also improve the secure, security of our systems. And how should we deal with logging so we're not leaking sensitive information and so on. And then at the end, we'll see how everything can come together in a pretty cool way, uh, approach to handling enterprise security, something called the three R's of enterprise security. So that's the agenda of today. So store configuration in the environment. This is actually one of the factors in, in the factors in the 12 factor app methodology. It's about putting configuration in the environment. And the reason for this when you're in the cloud is that you want to be able to have an application that is environment agnostic. So you want to be able to build an application and then deploy it in like a test environment, a staged environment, and a production environment, and the application shouldn't care. That's the reason for why you want to do this. But as it turns out, you can actually get a couple of security benefits if you design your application to behave this way. So let's start off by how you typically do when you start writing your coding a new project. You put all the configuration in your code because that's the easiest way to do it and you should keep it easy because you're just trying to make things work. So in this example we create a little bit of a database connection class and you can put like the port, uh, some timeouts and then you maybe put the, the password and the username in there. And I'm pretty sure that everybody in this room knows that putting your password in the code is a bad idea. But just for the sake of an argument, let's see and analyze why this is a bad idea from a security perspective. Well, if you put your passwords in the code, then anyone who has access to your code repo, your version control system, can read the secrets. And you have no idea who read it, when, and what they read, because there's no audit trail. Right? I can download the code, and then I can do whatever I want to. That's a pretty, uh, pretty big issue uh, from a security point of view. Now, luckily, this type of initial code always get refactored and changed. But the reason for why we refactor that as developers is not necessarily because of security, it's because we want to be able to deploy the application in different environments. So what do we do? Well, we extract the configuration and externalize it, and maybe we put it in a resource file, the configuration file. And you know, this is just an example in the YAML, a file that contains multiple configurations. But then you essentially deploy the application and you deploy the file and when you start up the application in, let, let's say, the test environment, the application reads the file and gets the configuration from that. So now you actually achieve that, that um, what you wanted to do, that you want the environment to be able to run in different environments. But we're still having security issues, right? Because 
Well, first off, you have to put the configuration file in some kind of version control. So you have the same problems as when you put it in the uh, source code. But then you're also putting the file on the server in plain text. So anyone with access to the server can now read whatever secrets you have in there. And it, you're very limited when you put a file on a file system to actually have control over who can do what on a file. You can get a little bit of control, but not much. Um, uh, it's, as I said, it's really hard to get an audit trail on who's looking at the data in the file. And then someone come up, comes up with the idea, well, what if I encrypt the, the sensitive data, the password? If I encrypt that and put the encrypted value in the resource file, then I can check it in in source code. I can put the file on the disk. It's, it's safe. Yes, it's safe. But then you need some way for the application to decrypt that value. So you need to provide an encryption key to the application. And where do you put the encryption file, uh, key? Yeah, maybe in another file, but then again, how do you protect that file? So it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. So can we solve these challenges or some of these challenges by applying the concept of putting configuration in the environment? It turns out we can. So the concept is really simple conceptually. Basically the platform, the cloud, is creating the environment and deploying the application. And when the platform is creating the environment, it injects the configuration into the environment. So if you're running Linux, it would be environment variables. And when you start the application, the application can simply read all the configuration from the environment and use it. So you shifted the, uh, the responsibility of managing secrets to the platform, right? This is good because first of all, the developers and the developer team no longer has to care about secrets. We shouldn't have to care about that. We don't have to share that knowledge between so many people. And it's easier to create an audit trail because now it's managed centrally by the platform, by the cloud platform or the platform as a service. So it's a lot easier to get a good audit trail and implement that. As I said, we minimize the number of people who can actually see the secrets. Usually it's just a few couple of sys admins and not even all platform admins need to be able to read the secrets that the platform is injecting. But we haven't really solved the problem with how do we protect the passwords and the secrets at rest, right? Because the platform still needs to store this somewhere before we can inject it. So we haven't solved that, but we have enabled us to do something to start converting the secrets into ephemeral secrets. And we'll see that later in the presentation, how we can do that. So this is a prerequisite for doing that. So simply by adhering to the concept of putting configuration in the environment, we can use that to push ourselves and force our, ourselves to treat secrets like passwords and access keys in a more secure way in our applications. Another main advice that you'll get when you start looking at building applications that are cloud native is they tell you you should run your application as a stateless process. You know, microservices should be stateless. So if we break this down, we can break this down into, I break, broke it down to three subcategories that I think are interesting from a security point of view. You want to be able to run the application as multiple stateless processes, right? And you also want to be able to separate, or you should think about separating the deployment of the application and the actual running of the application. You should think in terms of separate processes. and. You should only allow, if you have multiple instances that are stateless, those instances should only be allowed to communicate with each other using backing services. So let's take a look at each and one of these and see what they mean and what they can bring in terms of security benefits. Running the app with multiple stateless processes is pretty much well known. The reason for why you want to do that in the cloud is because you want to be able to scale your application horizontally. You want to be able to add instances and remove instances depending on the load which is really good. And when you're handling more load, what you're actually doing is making your service more available, which is really good. But you also have the possibility to kill off instances that behave, that behave badly. So if an instance, for some reason, maybe it's been compromised or maybe it's, it's broken, starts serving bad data, you can just kill it off and the next request can be handled by another instance. So you're actually improving the integrity of the data that is served by the service. So I use two big words here, availability and integrity. What does that have to do with security? Well, 
there's an acronym called CIA that comes from the information security field and it's used as a model to analyze and assess security and information but it's also a good model to use when you're thinking about the security in an application or a system so the CIA stands for confidentiality integrity and availability confidentiality essentially meaning that data should only be given to those who are authorized to read it right and the integrity basically says that you're only supposed to be able to change or mutate data if you're authorized to do so and it also means that if you're sending data over the network for example you should be able to protect the data so it doesn't get tampered with when you're sending it over the network you want to protect the integrity of the message and availability stands for being able to present and deliver the correct data at the correct time if you're not able to do that then maybe someone else will present uh, the, the receiver with some corrupt data that becomes a security issue so that's why increasing the availability and the integrity of a system will increase the security of the system and we'll continue to use this this model to analyze the challenges and the benefits we can get using these different design techniques so the next thing about processes, processes is that you want to separate the way you deploy the application and the way you run it. All right, Because a lot of times when you're running on bare bones servers in-house, what you'll do is that you'll use some kind of admin using user, a privileged user. You're logging on to a server, you send over the binary, and you start the process. The problem is the process then runs as that privileged user maybe that user even has root access so what then happens is if that application gets compromised then the hacker actually has root access on your server which is a very bad idea they can do pretty much anything so what you want to do is you want to deploy the application using the uh, the admin user but then you want to start the process as a different user and a user created explicitly to run that application process and that user shouldn't have more privileges than it actually needs. So for example, a web application only needs to start up a, a port to listen on HTTP traffic. You should be able to uh, maybe connect to a database and maybe write a temporary files to some directory. And that's it. You shouldn't do anything more. So having a vulnerability in an application shouldn't automatically lead to the entire server being compromised. You're applying the principle of least privilege here. All right? And you can do this just by following the best practices in the cloud environment. And if you're running a platform, it will do this for you. And suddenly, without thinking about it, you actually got a more secure software. And another thing, if you now have built your applications to be stateless, you have multiple instances, but then the actual service or the application needs to handle some kind of client state. You need to keep state between multiple requests. How do you do that? You're not supposed to have state in the application. Where well, you put the state in backing services. And a backing service can be a database, it can be a message queue, it can be a distributed cache or whatever. But you put the state there. And then when the next request comes in and ends up being served by a different instance, that instance can read up the state from the backing service and then serve the request. Now backing services doesn't really improve security by itself, but it's a requirement to have that kind of service if you want to keep client state in, uh, when using stateless instances of your application. So once it enables you to have stateless applications, which in turn enables you to increase the availability and the integrity of the system. And as we know, that improves the security. So what about logging? You know, most cloud platforms will tell you that you should treat logging as a service, just like any other service. You have a messaging service, you have a uh, persistent service, and you should have a log service. And the reason, f one of the reasons for why they'll tell you that in the cloud is because an application running in the cloud shouldn't be aware of stuff like file systems. You shouldn't write to a disk because the disk doesn't belong to you. They've abstracted that away. That's why they use the term platform as a service. The file system is part of the platform, that's just a service. Now, what does logging to a service have to do with security? Well, let's look at that from a CIA perspective. What about the confidentiality? Well, what you do typically do is that you develop your application, you use your favorite log framework, and you log to console out, 
And then when you put it, it's time to go to production, you configure it to write to disk. And then you put that on your server and you run and you log to disk. What's the problem with that? Well, from a confidentiality problem uh, point of view, there's a problem because you put you tend to put a lot of data in your logs because you think that will help you when you're debugging a problem. Or maybe you're using the log as some kind of transaction log or proof of something, so you need the data to be in the log. But when you put so much data into the log, some of that data is probably going to be sensitive. And I'm guessing that most of you guys and girls are here from Europe, so you're probably aware of something called the GDPR. So by now you should be aware of what actually is sensitive data in your company. So you can judge whether or not your log file contains sensitive data. But if it does contain sensitive data, you have to start treating it like that too. So now it means you have to limit and control access to that log. You have to have an audit trail of who accessed the log files and so on. And this is really hard to do when it's just a file on a file system. You're very limited in what you can do. Kind of the same problem we had when we put resource files and configuration files on the server. From an integrity point of view, it's also a problem. Because not many of us think about how to protect the integrity of the log file. If I'm looking at the log file, how do I know that someone hasn't changed the data in the log file? How do I know that someone hasn't removed something from that? This can be really serious, especially if you're using the log file as some kind of transaction log. And again, um, it's very hard to restrict this kind of uh, read and write and mutating action when it's just a file on the file system. And the availability part is also a challenge here. Because when you write a lot of log files, huge log files down on disk, disk space tends to run out. How many here have experienced an application crash due to insufficient disk space? Hands up. A lot of people, me too. And your application crashes, and then your service becomes unavailable, and that's a security problem, right? And some kind of sysadmin is supposed to move files, you know, to a file server every now and then, but you always forget and your application dies. That's also a problem. Another thing is that since you're starting to use stateless processes, right, you've learned that you should be able to take down your application at any time. And what if you kill off a server and terminate it because it's a virtual server and you forgot to move the log files? Now the data is gone. You've lost it. So the data is not available and will never be available again. That's also a security issue. So the concept of logging as a service is fairly simple. Instead of your having your application writing log events down to disk, you should just send it straight to a service that can accept it and process it and protect it. And the good news is you, you don't have to write your own uh, logging framework to do this. Because first, the world doesn't need another logging framework. Secondly, probably chances are your favorite logging framework already supports this. You can just configure whatever you're using logback, log4j to send messages over the network. Or if you're using some kind of special protocol, you can just write your own little hook or adapter and configure your logging framework to use that. So you're sending the messages straight over to the service. And since that service is dedicated and its primary concern is to handle and manage logs, it will actually do stuff like only uh, allowing authorized users to read the log data, for example. Someone that tries to read the log da data that is not authorized is not going to be able to do that. And the log service will manage the storage of the data and it will keep a very good audit trail. So just by moving the logging to a service, some kind of centralized service, will actually solve pretty much all the security challenges we had when putting log files on disk. We get, it's easier to protect the confidentiality of the data, right? Because the, lo the exposure of the logs is just going to be using an API in the log service or maybe a UI. You can enforce authorization there. It's easy to implement a good audit trail because you're only exposing data through a dedicated API and the log service can keep an audit trail. If you want to, you can enforce the integrity of the log data because you built a log service that is dedicated to managing data 
And if you want to, you can actually start digital assign each log event. So now you know if someone has um, tried to tamper with that data, you can verify that very easily. And if you don't want anyone to change the data, if you want to treat the data as a read-only event stream, you simply don't expose any mutating operations through the log service. And the availability tends to be uh, better because now you have a team building a log service. They're not going to forget to rotate logs or move logs off the disk or the database where you store it because now it's the primary concern of the team that is managing the log service. So you're thinking about it actively. You're not going to lose data by mistake. Now, all these three concepts, they can improve the security in and by themselves, which is really cool. But what's even cooler is that they can all come together and work as enablers to something called the three R's of enterprise security. Now, the three R's of enterprise security, something, uh, a concept coined by Justin Smith, who is um, a security chief security officer at a company called Pivotal. And I believe he wrote a blog post about it first in 2016-ish. Uh, but the essential idea that he's trying to talk about is that since the tools and the possibilities that we have when we develop applications in a cloud environment is pretty much radically different compared to the possibilities we have when we're building and running in a non-cloud environment. Since that's the case, isn't it just you know logical that the approach to managing enterprise security should be equally different? It makes sense. And what three R's is, it stands for rotate, repair, and repave. You want to rotate your secrets every few minutes or hours. You want to repave servers and applications at least every few hours. And when you repair vulnerable software just a few hours after a new patch has been released. Okay, so if you think about this, this is actually pretty radically different to traditional ways of managing security in an enterprise. Why is that? Well, we're basically saying that in order to reduce risk, we should increase change. Right? And what we typically do in enterprise security is that we want to minimize risk and we want to minimize change. Right? We make sure, we think the, the approach is that if we change a server, chances are we introduce a security vulnerability. Right? So we implement processes that will make sure that a change takes a very long time so we can assure ourselves that we're not introducing vulnerabilities. And we think that if we can detect and monitor changes, we can protect ourselves from hackers. So we buy tools that will monitor your systems and your application and send an alert every time they detect a change and say that, hey, this might be an ongoing attack. So everything we do today, a lot of times, is trying to prevent and minimize change. Now we're saying the total opposite with the three R's. We're saying you should increase change. Why is that? Well. A system that stays static for a very long time and doesn't change is the perfect target for something called an APT, an Advanced Persistent Threat. An APT is pretty much the type of hacks that will get, uh, that will end up in the headlines. You know, the type of attack that will steal tons of juicy data, the type of attacks that will cost a lot of money for the companies affected. One reason they can steal that data is because they're very advanced, but also because they're very persistent. That means that this is not the type of attack that, will, that you'll do in a couple of seconds. This attack can go on for, for weeks, for months, maybe for years. And when you're doing that kind of long-term hacking in a system, a system that stays static is the perfect target. Because if you find a vulnerability, you want to be able to use that vulnerability as much as possible if you're a hacker. So by preventing change, you're actually helping the hacker. So time is the friend of the hacker in this case. So what if we can remove time from the hacker's plate? Well, we can do that by starting changing our system. That's the basic idea of the three R's. 
we increase change and by that we can actually make it a lot harder for attackers doing advanced uh, hacking techniques. So, rotate secrets every few minutes or hours. Well, essentially that means, let's say you have a password to a service or to a database. Then you want to change that password, let's say every five minutes. Then you replace it. That sound, may sound really hard. You may think, how in the world am I going to implement this? But if you apply the concept that we talked about earlier about putting configuration in the environment, it actually becomes pretty easy because now your application doesn't have to be aware of that we're rotating the passwords. The platform is managing that for the application. So the platform can now take the responsibility of injecting a new password into the environment every five minutes. And all the application has to do is take the password from the environment whenever it needs to use it. And what's even cooler is, like we talked about earlier, since we're constantly replacing the password and it's always expiring after a very short time, we don't have to store it anywhere. The platform doesn't even have to put it in their configuration file. We can just generate a new password, inject it into the environment, and then you're done. The only place where the password will live is in RAM. All right, so now you solve the problem we're having to think about how do I encrypt the password when I put it in a configuration file. You remove the need. The secrets have become ephemeral. They only live for a very short time. Now sometimes, and I want to mention this, sometimes you don't want the platform to manage all this. Sometimes the application needs to be aware of it for whatever reason, an architectural reason, or maybe it involves some kind of business logic that you don't want to put in your platform. Now another approach is to have the application actively go out and fetch the new password. So you can say the application says, hey, I need a password to connect to this database. Then it can go off to a service and say, hey, I need a password. The service says, here's the password, and by the way, it will expire in five minutes. And then the application can use that password, and it also has to remember that after five minutes, I have to go and ask for a new password. Now there are, you don't have to build this yourself either. There are solutions and products that you can use. There are open source solutions, there are proprietary solutions. Uh, just to mention one, uh, Vault is a popular open source solution that you can use which basically you can deploy as a service and they will manage all kinds of secrets, not just passwords. And they provide SDKs that you can use in your application so you don't have to write all the logic of you know, keeping track of expired passwords and everything like that. But this is a good design pattern to know when you actually want your application to be aware of this rotation. And of course, it's not just passwords that you should rotate. You should rotate all types of secrets access tokens, API tokens, and certificates. Right, so typically, a lot of times you have a certificate they use for HTTPS, for example, between your internal servers, and someone will generate a certificate, put it on a server, and it might have an expiry time in a year or so, but you always forget to renew it, right? Always. And when that certificate expires, everything stops working, and the availability goes out the window. So that's a pretty good pro uh, big problem. If you start rotating your certificates and you only say that, hey, let's this certificate is only going to be valid for, we'll say, 10 minutes, then we're going to replace it. We're not even going to renew it. We're going to replace it with a new one. So now we kind of remove the problem of having expired certificates. And the whole purpose of rotating secrets all the time in this fashion is that if a secret leaks for whatever reason, you want to minimize the time that you can use that in a way that it's not supposed to be used. Right? So if a hacker is able to steal a certificate, now you'll, he'll, he or she only have 10 minutes to use it, for example. It's all about minimizing the attack vector. The next R stands for repave. It's about repaving servers and applications at least every few hours. If you can do it more often, that's good. Basically, what this is all about is that you want to recreate, or repave a server instance from a known good state, right? And you want to recreate your application instance also. 
So basically, if you have a bunch of uh, instances running of your application, you want to create a new instance from a, a fresh new instance. If you're using containers or virtual machines, you can use a base image that you create in your server instance. You put the same version of your application in there and you start it up. And once it's running, you can kill off an old instance. And then pretty much every cloud platform in-house or public will you know, support something called like rolling deployment. So you can do this without introducing any downtime in your system. You're just constantly replacing the servers. You don't want your servers to have a long uptime. And the idea behind this is that if a server or an application, application gets compromised, you can just kill it off. And when you're killing that instance off, you're actually also killing any malicious software that happens to be on that server. And one thing to remember is when you're shutting down an instance, you want to completely destroy it. Don't reuse anything. And that also includes if you have like a file mount where you put temporary files, make sure to wipe that file mount. Otherwise, when you start up new instance and use the same file mount, maybe you're reusing some malicious software that is placed in those temporary files. And if you're running containers, containers always run on a host. And a lot of the time that host will be a virtual machine. And then you might actually consider to repave the host also, not just the containers. And again, this is something you can do even if you're running in-house. You don't have to be in a public cloud to do this. The thing that's different that you may not do before you start repaving is that you, you're redeploying your application even if you're not have a new version. So that's a slight change in your mindset. Otherwise, you usually when you redeploy something, it's because you have a new version of your software. But now you're just redeploying it because it's fun and because it brings you better security. It's all about having parts moving, being able to kill off in a malicious software. The repair part. If there's a security patch available for, let's say, an operating system, you should be able to put that into production in just a few hours. It shouldn't take longer than that. And this applies to both operating systems and application level. And you want to recreate everything from scratch and you don't do an incremental update. So you're not going to log into an existing server, apply the patch and say you're done because if that server is, has already been compromised, it's still going to be compromised after you patch to secure the whole. All right? So basically the process for doing it is that a patch gets released you get alerted about it. Oh. Um, let's see if my clicker works here. There it goes. The patch is released, and you take the patch and you create a new known good state. You create a new base image for your container or for your virtual machine. And then you can start verifying that using whatever process you have to verify new software into production. And once you have this good new state, then you can apply the repave process again and just roll out the new server uh, version or Linux version or whatever you're using. Now the trick here is sometimes putting a new patch on an OS level to get that out into production, sometimes it can take weeks or even longer in a lot of companies. You, the challenge here is trying to reduce that so you can actually do this in a few hours. Since you're able to repave, you have automated that process, so that should buy you a lot of time. And since the platform, pretty much any platform, will allow you to do things like green deployment, uh, blue green deployments, canary release, and so on, means that if something goes wrong, you can do a safe and fast rollback. That also allows you to shorten down, perhaps shorten down the time that you spend on verification or that you used to spend on verification to make sure that you didn't break anything. Like in the good old days, when you do everything by hand, you're afraid that you're going to miss something in your configuration. But now we're starting to automate everything. So this, you have all the possibilities to shrink that verification time. Because you want to be able to do this just within a few hours. Now, repairing also applies to your own applications. Not just others, other applications. It applies to the code that you write. So basically, as, as soon as you you make a change in your software, you want to be able to produce a version of that software that is good to go for production. Basically, you want to use concepts from you know continuous delivery and continuous deployment to always be production ready. 
and then you want to push that out into production. And why do you want to do that? Well, it's all about change again. Let's say your application has a vulnerability, maybe because of a bug that you wrote and you're not aware of it. If you change something in your code, you know, maybe you happen to remove that bug by accident. So if a hacker is exploiting that and you suddenly push out a new version, you, now the hacker has to find a new way to exploit your application. And the same concept applies here. So of course, don't, don't do incremental updates. Always repay everything from the ground up. So even if you're deploying new versions of your applications or your, you know, your operating system, always repay. And one thing that you want to remember is that you don't want to forget about third-party dependencies. I'm sure everybody of us is using tons of third-party dependencies, and all those dependencies can also contain vulnerabilities. They're just software, the code. Now, luckily, there are a lot of tools you can use to help you detect uh, security problems in uh, third-party dependencies. You have you know, plugins and tools that you can jack into your delivery or continuous delivery pipeline running in Jenkins or whatever. And then the tool can alert you and say, hey, you have this library as a dependency, and there's a security vulnerability. Maybe there's even a patch you should upgrade. And then you can take action and upgrade that dependency, build your application, verify it worked, and then push it out into production. It's all doable. You just have to set it up and have it as a continuous process, and then redeploy it again. You're constantly changing it, you're constantly patching your software to minimize the time that you're exposed to some evil person. So, to kind of summarize the, the basic idea of the three R's of enterprise security is that the mindset should be that if you can, are able to create an ever-changing system, ever-changing software, what you're doing really is you're, you're battling persistent threats. Right, time is the, the the friend of the attacker, and you remove time. So you kind of starve the attacker of time. Every changing software is the nemesis of persistent threats. So we've looked at how to handle application configuration in a secure way. We should put it in the environment, which is a good enabler for pushing you to start thinking about how to handle secrets in a good way. And all the tools are there, so you don't actually have to think about it. Even if you don't think about what you're doing, just following the 12-factor app methodology that says you should put configuration in the environment, just by doing that, you're making a, a more secure software. The idea is about how to run your applications as different processes will also help you increase security. One thing that I forgot to mention when I was talking about processes is admin processes. And I should mention that is that a lot of times you have administrative tasks that you do, right? Uh, and typically that those administrative tasks are performed by the sysadmins or the operations team. And they'll log into a server, run a bunch of terminal commands to do stuff, or maybe they bring up a database UI and then run a bunch of SQL commands straight into the database. Now, this is also a problem from a security point of view because first of all, those tools, terminal access and database access, are too broad. You can do anything with that. So if you get access to that, you can do anything. So by uh, uh, creating, instead of using processes like that, you create a dedicated administrative API and run that as a process together with the application. The only thing you can do to administer is to predefine tasks. Again, you're reducing the attack vector of what you can do as an admin user. And then the, another benefit by doing that is now suddenly the developer and the development team owns the administration. So the administration tasks and the application logic goes hand in hand because that's another problem. What if your app uh, development team decides to refactor the database, deploy that new version, and then the sysadmin needs to do the boring admin task and do some stuff in the database, but the schema has changed or the meaning of the data has changed and now suddenly you're destroying the data in the database. So you completely ruin the integrity of the data and possibly crash the entire app. Another security problem. But again, if you, if you deploy a separate admin API as a separate process on the server, you've limited that access. We also looked at 
how to treat logging. He said, use logging as a service. Don't log to files because then you're leaking information and you have a hard time protecting that information. Use a dedicated logging service that will help you treat logs as they should be treated. If they're sensitive, you can enforce rules and you can uh, apply authorized access to them and so on. And we looked at the concept of three R's of enterprise security, how a radically different mindset in terms of managing security in a big system can actually improve the security, vastly improve the security in my opinion, compared to a more traditional approach of enterprise security. And of course, I can't do a talk without doing a shameless plug. Uh, all the ideas in this talk is part of a book that I'm a co-author of, it's called Secure by Design. Uh, it's not finished yet, but it's, uh, we think it's going to be in stores in this winter. We're almost finished in terms of content. Uh, so if you're interested, you can check it out and you can actually buy it already if you want to in an early access program. Then you can get feedback to me and the authors, which we really appreciate and we can make the book better. So I think we have time for a couple of questions if you want to. This is a microphone come here. Uh, so you mentioned logging. Uh, do you have any good patterns preventing developers leaking information, sensitive information to the log itself? I mean like logging down the basic OWS header or something like that. Yes, uh, I do. Uh, and, and a lot of time when you logging uh, sensitive information like that is by mistake, right? You, you're not thinking about it. That, that's the biggest problem. If you think about it, then you know you're logging sensitive data. Uh, some of the patterns I, I talked about last year, <laughs> but we have, um, you can do that on a code level. For example, you can design your, your objects. If you start, instead of having just the sensitive data as a string, uh, you, you can create something we call a, a read once object, for example. Uh, you create a type that represents that object and you can, let's say it's a password, you're only going to allow the code to read the value once, otherwise you can explode. Another approach is if you want to read a lot of times, you can just uh, make sure that, uh, for example, the toString method doesn't reveal the data. You can replace it with just uh, star 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 or something. Uh, so those kind of design patterns is really useful in, uh, in my experience to prevent that kind of accidental leakage, right? So as a developer, when you really want the data, you can instead of using like two string, you can use dot value or something. And then you get because the, the biggest problem when it comes to logging is that you you just log a big object, and you don't think about what what that object contains, or maybe it doesn't contain sensitive value to begin with, but then later on someone refactors that object and suddenly you have a sensitive data in it. So those are the type of t approaches that I like to use. So, uh, regarding the dynamic retrieval of secrets, how do you prevent the attacker from following the actual same path of, you know, set, setting up a small script or something that would uh, exploit that same route? Okay, you mean like, for example, um, let's say I had an example where the application goes and asks for a password. Yeah, so that, that's. Uh, um, see if I can answer that without getting into her details, but um, basically, let's say I mentioned Vault. If you look at their approach, uh, you can't just ask for a password. So the Vault is specifically using a lot of access tokens. So the application needs an access token or some kind of token to just be able to ask for the passwords, and then they're also replacing those tokens all the time. So there's a lot of tokens and communication going back and forth that again will, will minimize um, the attack vector and initially when you deploy the application you will give the application a one-time token uh, is kind of uh, the, the application can use to get another access token to then get the password so you see it starts to get complicated it's, it's tokens going back and forth and it's all made to minimize but of course you can never build 100% secure software. There's always going to be some loophole, but those are the approaches that I've typically seen that uh, these kind of solutions try to employ to make it really hard to just go in and, and intercept the traffic. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, 
you describe this uh, three R's, so I'm recreating the stuff. So I guess this is for this stateless uh, process, like my applications. Is it somehow applicable also for those backing services like databases or queues? Would it be practical or doesn't make sense? It's maybe in platform or... Okay, yeah, th that's a very good question. I guess that would highly depend on the implementation of the backing service. I mean, um, I'm pretty sure it's some of, let's say you're running a database, you can't just kill off a database, <laughs> you're going to lose all the data. So uh, I would say the answer, would, the boring answer would be, it really depends on the backing service. Maybe is there an example of something where it makes sense? Uh, well, maybe if you have a some kind of clustered solution, let's say, um, uh, I'll try not to mention proprietary names, but let's say you have your uh, storage solution that is uh, clustered and you have a lot of instances, then those instances are redundant and then you should theoretically be able to killing off those instances and replace them with new ones because they're all making up their own clusters. So then you should be able to apply that concept on uh, the persistent service too. So uh, I think you, you'll have to look at the, the solution that you have and see, can I apply this concept? And, and also, of course, uh, is it easy to do? Will the security benefits outweigh the, the, the problems uh, with trying to make it work? But conceptually, I think it should work, and I think you should definitely look at it uh, once you're there and able to do it. I saw that you used an example of Oracle database and managing secrets for Oracle database. Have you actually tried and succeeded to, to rotate uh, secrets to access Oracle database? Okay, did I have an Oracle example? Well, it was both one five to one. Okay, so then, I, then I I, it was that, that was a mistake. <laughs> I, should, I, should, I should mask that. Well, um, let's see. Uh, I don't think I've done it specifically on, on Oracle. Um, to be honest, I've probably just done it on other databases. Um, so I, I don't really no, I don't have personal experience of doing that. Uh, well, it's more general because it's probably the same case. It's it's a bit more general because it's going to be the same case with uh, any database that has mm -hmm. connection pooling. So well, yeah. when you try to uh, change the secrets and you have existing connections with old secrets, what's going to happen? Would you shut down the whole service or just? And you know, dynamically change the secrets. Uh, please, can you say that again? I didn't hear. Oh, sorry. Uh, what would happen when uh, the application had a connection pool to the database and you change the secret? Would you restart the service you have or just dynam dynamically change the secrets and uh, do some magic to turn off old connections? Okay, yeah. Uh, that's also a good question. Uh, I think I would. I would look at the behavior of my application and see and combine that with things like how often, for example, how often do I repay, for example. Let's say I repay every hour, then maybe one solution, an easy solution would be to say, okay, I'm going to let my password be valid for one hour. So then I can keep the connection pool because maybe it's too much of a performance hit to, to restart everything, right? Because there's a reason why you have a connection pool because you want fast access. Um, uh, another thing is that you also want to use different users and different passwords for every, every application instance, right, which also kind of minimizes the attack vector. So in the specific case of a, a database connection pool, I, I would really look at what possibilities do I have with my implementation of the connection pool in terms of restarting it versus possible performance hits. Uh, if I don't care about performances, maybe I can just reconnect and so on. So I, I have to, I think you have to look at the big picture and see, you know, can I be really strict and say that I have to replace it after five minutes or, you know, sh should it, does it make more sense to let this particular password be valid for a longer time? So to follow up to that, um, how do you actually resolve the problem with legacy applications, uh, which uh, legacy in the sense of handling credentials and secrets uh, where you cannot just let the secret expire softly and then expire hard. You can just change the password. How do you maintain availability of the application 
throughout the rotation of the password. Okay, yeah. Well, if you're dealing with the first thing is I would try to see can I refactor it, but sometimes you can't do that because it's so legacy that you don't want to, you don't even want to touch it, right? But then one option is to just say that okay, this is a an, an old application and we can't possibly motivate ourselves to change it. So let's um, but maybe we can repave it, right? Because you can still restart it. So. Again, you, 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 one possible solution is to say for this application, we're going to be a little bit more lenient and say the password can be valid for a longer time, but then we can at least start repaying it often. So it's kind of like you have a third party software, you can't change it. Right? So you just have to work with what you got. Because, uh, I mean, uh, pretty much all of us uh, feel the pain of legacy software every now and then, <laughs> and, and you try to work with what you have. But, but absolutely, it's a lot easier if you're able to either build a new project or if you're able to refactor the code. And there's always a challenge when you're trying to retrofit uh, these patterns into legacy code. So, um, I don't know. Any more questions? Otherwise, I think this might be another talk coming up. Thank you very much.